In this episode, we're talking about renewable natural gas with GreenLane Renewable CEO Brad DeVille. Brad joined GreenLane in 2017 after a 25-year career in the natural gas commercial vehicle industry. He was a founding member of Westport Innovations. Brad understands the natural gas vehicle industry extremely well. And GreenLane is a leading global provider of biogas upgrading systems. The company's solutions create clean, low-carbon, renewable natural gas known as RNG, which is suitable for injection into the natural gas grid and for direct use as a vehicle fuel. Brad, welcome back. You know, it's been a couple of years since we last uh, saw you. So why should be viewers be taking a look at this sector right now? What's happened to, to really start to heat up this market? Well, thanks for having me back, Stuart, and I'm uh, really happy to be here and, and talk about RNG and Green Lane. And, you know, why why should people be looking at this space? Um, you know, let me, let me back up a little bit. Green Lane's been at this uh, in about 30 years, but it wasn't really until the last few years when things really took off and and that's not unexpected for you know all sorts of industries that have uh, you know a take-up rate people have to get familiar with it the industry has to mature and evolve and know how to do what it does which is really a, a, the story of green lane and what's happened in the last couple of years is um, you know obviously people have become much more familiar with the uh, the dire need to address climate change um, and if you look at um, the natural gas system, as contrasted to the electricity system, uh, it actually delivers more energy, um, and it, it has to. It, but it's much earlier in its journey for decarbonization. So that's why we're having a lot of enthusiasm um, in the natural gas distribution network. But really, it started uh, even before that in the transportation space. Uh, so this is commercial vehicles that use diesel today. Uh, you know, diesel's been the predominant fuel for decades, uh, and it's really hard to displace diesel. And, and RNG has been um, has become really the uh, the number one alternative uh, to diesel fuel in that space, and that's really what's fueled um, the tremendous growth over the last couple of years. So, for a lot of viewers, they'll be going, "Well, what's the difference between RNG and LNG? Are, are we not talking the same thing?" And maybe we are at the chemical composition level, but it's how we get there. Yeah, that's right. We have RNG, we have CNG, we have LNG, compressed, liquefied, renewable, and and chemically they're all identical, but it's really where they come from. So we talk about CNG and LNG in the context of fossil-derived natural gas. RNG being the renewable derived and therefore not adding any net uh, carbon to the environment. In fact, in many cases, it, 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 it acts as if it's extracting carbon uh, from the environment, and we can, we can talk about that. Um, but then it can come in compressed or liquid uh, forms. So, you know, the same uh, delivery modes uh, to the market. And, and the reason where it's attractive displacing diesel in commercial vehicles is you do need a new engine. That engine has to run on uh, on methane or in, you know CNG or LNG, but right now, because people who are looking for an alternative to diesel, they're typically doing it because of um, their you know their sustainability plans and and the economics, and that's driving things towards uh, RNG. Also, in places like the U.S. that have um, by law the distributors of diesel fuel and gasoline have to have growing amounts of renewable content. And RNG is a real obvious one for them because it has the deepest uh, carbon cuts of any alternative and um, you know, kind of biggest bang for your buck when you're looking to uh, get the renewable content into your portfolio. And so that's why we're seeing a lot of um, activity from the, the oil and gas super majors like the Shells, the Chevrons, the, the BPs, um, who really moved into this space in a, in a significant way uh, putting hundreds of millions of dollars to work, uh, building projects, buying equipment from us, um, and uh, looking to, to drive those RNG volumes into their uh, distribution networks. So what are the main sources of your raw material? You know, I can think of uh, farm, agricultural waste, uh, garbage dumps, and so on. Are, are those the main areas, or is it a, a wider sort of a source of uh, raw material for you to be able to start capping and capturing? 
Yeah, well, it's pretty much any uh, decomposing organic matter. So the most uh, prevalent ones are landfills. Of course, those are those are everywhere in every municipality. Uh, wastewater treatment plants is an obvious, you know, another one. So those are places where you have uh, organic matter. They have energy content left. They decompose and they produce what's referred to as biogas, which is a mixture of methane and, and, and carbon dioxide. And then, you know, the trick that what we do is to separate those and clean it up and get it pipeline uh, grade. Other sources, as you mentioned, are agricultural sources, and that's largely, you know, concentrated points like farms, uh, dairy farms, for example. Uh, so this is where, you know, obviously the cows, they do their thing and you have to collect the manure. Um, if you don't collect the manure, that actually um, lets raw methane go into the environment. So when I said earlier that you can have uh, renewable natural gas be carbon negative, um, that's because you're avoiding raw methane uh, from going to the environment. So when you have something like RNG derived from a dairy farm, it can be equivalent to removing uh, four to five times of the carbon uh, out of the out of the environment. So it's it's that's that's in part why the oil and gas guys are so enthusiastic about this is because when they when they get that ultra low carbon RNG, um, it it, it uh, factors prominently in the renewable fuel mix that they're obligated to get. It's also of great interest to uh, dairy farmers because they are acutely aware of uh, social pressures to reduce their carbon footprint. And so it works very well. And I like the fact that it's biogas. So uh, all around, it's something that started in the atmosphere, is consumed by uh, the plants and vegetation that uh, these animals eat. And then it comes back, we use it as fuel, goes back into the atmosphere for the same cycle again. It's really uh, quite remarkable. I know I'm taking a little bit of a sidebar, but I'm, I'm quite... Uh, enthusiastic about what you're doing. The question then is, how are you making money and are you making money? Yeah, absolutely. We're making we're making money right now. And, and how are we doing that? Uh, we sell equipment. We sell the equipment that does what we refer to in the industry as upgrading. So that's when we take this biogas, uh, we remove the impurities, and then we separate the carbon dioxide from the biomethane to create high purity biomethane that's suitable for direct use in vehicles or uh, direct injection into the local pipeline network. It has to meet the engine spec or it has to meet the pipeline injection specification that's set by the local distribution company or the pipeline owner. Um, and so as soon as it, you know, either at a farm or a wastewater treatment plant or at a landfill, as soon as it becomes gaseous uh, in the form of uh, biogas, then that's where we, you know, we swoop into action. We'll create the uh, specification for the equipment from our standard products. Uh, we'll, we'll oversee the installation and commissioning and then hand the plant over to the project owner. So we would sell to people like, uh, well, I mean, in December is a good example. We, uh, we signed a, a 12 million contract with Fortis BC. They had rights to the gas at the, at the Vancouver landfill. Um, so we're the equipment provider, the, the technology provider of the upgrading system uh, to do that. So that'll, in that case, they've got the rights to the gas of the landfill. And of course, it's, it's the Fortis BC uh, pipeline into which the gas will be injected. And they'll be the project owner in that case. I know that you also purchased AirDEP. Uh, tell us about that purchase and why it was important to uh, see that through. Yeah, so we... Uh, we, we, we raised some money about a year ago in the public markets, and, and that's, uh, remember, we're, we're a, a public company as of uh, just a, a two and a half years. And, and so last year was our first um, uh, starting point or entry point into the M&A space. So we wanted to do two kinds of M&A. One was a technology bolt-on. So these are things where we could enhance the IP within the company. Every biogas project has hydrogen sulfide, so that's the, you know, the, 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 the odor causing um, uh, impurities in biogas. And so recognizing that every project has that, we, we've been working to internalize the technologies that deal with hydrogen sulfide removal. We came across this company in Italy called AirDEP. Um, they had very attractive technology that does this. Um, up to now, 90% of their sales have been in Italy, so they've, they've been relatively undiscovered in other parts of the world. So we felt that was a really good opportunity to, uh, to bring them in-house. Uh, the, the leader of that business uh, was quite um, excited about taking his products globally. 
Uh, so that's the rationale. So we, you know, we brought that inside and uh, we're just, uh, we closed that just last month, or actually I guess it was February 1st officially when the deal closed. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about uh, being able to offer the incremental value to our customers in that case. You know, one of the other things that I know from when we spoke a couple of years ago, you were on the TSX Venture then, but you are just on the TSX uh, like full board now. Uh, what, what was the uh, shift? Uh, um, you know, uh, how did that come about? <laughs> That's maybe the best way to yeah, ask that well, question. Yeah, it's, it's been, um, I guess we, perhaps we guessed right. I mean, when we launched the business in the public markets in June of 2019, we started uh, as a venture listed company on the, the TSXV. And, you know, usually it takes quite a number of years to graduate to the senior board. Um, but our growth has been phenomenal. We've been growing you know, 100% annually, uh, more than that, in fact. And, um, you know, we just, we, we satisfied the senior board criteria uh, sooner than we thought. So we were only on the junior board for 18 months until we graduated. It was just a year ago now that, that we uh, that we graduated to the TSX. And, uh, you know, so far so good. It's been a really good response from the investor base. Uh, the markets um, certainly embraced uh, the products that we sell and, and it's been a, uh, a tremendous ride in terms of the, the, the growth in the business and we aren't, uh, we aren't really seeing that subside anytime soon. So I'm, I'm over time, but I'm, I'm fascinated by your business and where you're at. You, you, know, you had a considerable amount of interest in the renewable energy space. And like all markets, they go up and down a little bit, and your stock price reflected that. What's happening now, though, that makes you say, no, no, this is the, this is the space that is really worth looking at in the energy sector? Well, one analogy I think that, that is a good one to look at is wind and solar. So if you look 10 or 15 years ago, uh, people didn't really have a good familiarity with what that meant to build a wind projects or solar projects. That's kind of where RNG is today. So we're, you know, we're early in the journey, we're early in the penetration. Uh, the problem is much, much bigger uh, because really if you're a gas utility and you need to decarbonize, you have only really this one solution to do that. Either you know, reduce or, or go renewable. And so RNG is, is highly attractive for that. We've already talked about transportation, about uh, how quickly that's come up uh, in just the last few years in the US. Uh, this summer in Europe, uh, they just went to what's called RED2, which is the Renewable Energy Directive 2. It, it, it's starting to look a lot more like the mechanisms that are in the US that have been highly, highly successful to drive RNG into the transportation fuel mix. So we think that that's going to, um, to be replicated in Europe very, very, very quickly. And then we're also seeing some, you know, uh, energy security concerns coming back up again as to, you know, that's, as you were mentioning, is these are local sources, you know, local farms, and how do we grab these things that are otherwise waste and turn that into energy needs, uh, you know, right where they're needed. And, and so those are the dynamics. And it's, um, I think everyone's, you know, clued into this with, of course, the overarching driving force being the demand for decarbonization. And we have to get there and everyone with their net zero by 2050 ambitions and plans, uh, you know, that's, that's what's fueling the growth. Well, it's, a, uh, it's an exciting and very interesting market. And as you pointed out, the great thing about renewable uh, natural gas is that uh, it really is a low carbon footprint. I, you know, I can't thank you enough for your time today, and I hope that you're going to come back uh, in a couple months, maybe a little quicker than you did the last time around, and give us some updates on how uh, you're doing and new uh, innovations that are, uh, I'm sure, emerging. We'd love to. Thanks, Dave. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much.